I don't want to sound like too much of a hype lord, but Combat and Civilization 7, I think, could be the best that Civ has ever seen. Here's why the new systems and upgrades to combat more broadly shape a new, reformed era of combat in Civilization games. We quickly begin on the battlefield, the map in Civilization 7, obviously where your units will be navigating and fighting. Speaking of navigating, the headline announcement for Civ 7 was that it has introduced navigable rivers. Now, rivers, as you can see, no longer just a barrier to unit movement in combat, but potentially a benefit now too. In Civilization 7, and we'll discuss this more in a moment, units also interact with the map in new ways, and a wider variety of ways, like lighting tiles on fire. And finally, we have more terrain types than ever before, and potentially a greater use of elevation as well, in my personal experience. Moving along to our second topic, the units themselves. In a recent live stream that Firaxis gave while they were down under in Australia, they talked about the variety of units, the look and feel of everything, which of course will change throughout the three ages, and obviously change depending on the civilization that you're playing, their cultural heritage and their history. Perhaps more interestingly though, even within the same unit from the same Civ, like two spearmen or two pikemen, no version will be quite the same. Different animation, different movements, different equipment in their hands, that kind of thing. And while they're using that equipment in the fight, Firaxis have said that they want to make it feel more responsive, more like you're having an impact. You can see the fights playing out on the map during your turn, depending on what you've unlocked, of course. Focusing in specifically on some units, the Jaguar Slayer, my favorite example, this mine unit can set a trap on the map, which instantly ends an enemy unit's movement should they walk into it. Taking a look slightly further afield, this civilian has another commander, the initiative promotion, we'll talk about that in a moment, and yet again, that example of applying a burning status to a tile, which of course will deal damage to units at the end of their turn if they're still sitting on that burning tile. That one, I believe, coming out of Khmer. These specific units, alongside what you unlock generically through the generic tech tree, will ultimately of course shape the composition of an army, and I think that we're seeing a wider variety than before. Maybe not by really hugely significant magnitudes, but certainly leaning into specific specialities and benefits, bonuses. One of the greatest units in this game is the Commander. So let's talk about the Commanders. What do they do? How are they unique? I've played with them a little bit and I think they're pretty fun. A lot of units in Civ 7 have these new unique actions and movements, abilities, like the Scout here for example, and Commanders are no different. In fact, they could very well be the best example of that. The Commander, alongside normal things like promotions, has that new, probably the trademark ability, the ability to hoover up land units around it, condense them, form up into one cohesive army. One tile, one thing to control. The relief here, ah, <laughs> oh, oh, the micro reduction, I'm very grateful. Uh, moreover though, of course, you can continue to unstack these units, deploy them quickly, and Civilization 7 builds on this with something you may have already been introduced to, the Army Commander promotion system. As they gather experience, or potentially through some other means, you'll unlock these kinds of abilities. Inside of logistics, we see extra production or unit slots and faster reinforcement for the Commander, another one of their abilities. Through maneuvering, you can get a land unit benefit within the radius of your commander. They'll have extra combat strength, or opponents will lose a flanking bonus, lose some combat strength. And finally, we've also seen leadership. If you don't want to fight, station them in a settlement, and you'll get plus 5% yields across the board. The commanders therefore have a lot of usefulness versatility. That other ability that I just mentioned, that reinforcement, is also very strong. Train a unit, hit reinforce, and it'll just kind of teleport to the commander within potentially one turn. A very powerful way to utilize these commanders, not just on the battlefield for their extra strength and experience, but also logistically to get units around the map. Of course, there's still a lot more we don't know about combat in Civ 7, like the modern era, for example, but we have seen some great leaders revealed, specifically in terms of commanders. I'm thinking, of course, of Trung Truk, who has this very powerful, plus three promotions. Those promos we were just looking at on her first commander, 
as well as extra experience. Speaking of experience, the broader combat experience matters. Let's quickly talk state diplomacy and leadership before I give my own thoughts from experiencing this combat system. State diplomacy, leadership, another big part of the fight, though not directly related to the units, of course. The first thing that springs to mind when I think about this, not my video from yesterday, but rather the leader attributes. We don't have a great look at this, but we do briefly from one of the first trailers. You can see that the militaristic attributes, these upgrades that we can give our leaders through the ages, can provide combat strength, production towards training military units, reduce gold maintenance, increase happiness potentially if they're garrisoned in a city. Down the bottom of the tree there's some even spicier things, so give the detail, like units healing faster plus 2 HP, and you can just repeat that one over and over. Or commanders gaining a free level, and new commanders starting with an extra one. These abilities that you can apply to your leader, again as you move through the ages, probably based on what you've done, will have an impact on combat. And more broadly, of course, your leader will be interacting with other leaders, other civilizations. As we discussed in my most recent video, so I'll just highlight it quickly here, the role of the city-state could be more powerful than ever before. These evolving independent peoples have the ability to literally print you free units by bolstering their military using your influence, and then taking that unit, levying it completely for free. Moreover, though, there will, of course, be the return of specific city-states with specializations like militaristic, scientific, so on and so forth. And as we briefly learned in that very precious YouTube short, the kinds of abilities that we can pick up from these militarist suzerains seem very strong. Extra combat strength, the different types of units, stacking depending on how many other city-states you are the suzerain of. They don't need to be military either, just any old one. 50% uh, extra experience for commanders, greater production, you name it. This is going to be another huge piece of the puzzle, alongside, of course, interacting with other leaders. Diplomatic deals, trades, war declarations. And finally, that overarching element, that framing of the game and of each age, through specifically, of course, these militaristic milestones. Within the first age, if you can get 12 towns or cities in your empire, conquered ones do count as two, you'll receive some extra special awards and of course get to that golden age status. And finally, who you're playing yourself matters as well. Again, a gentle reminder that some of the leaders are much more militaristic than others. Plus three combat strength across the board in foreign territory or neutral seems pretty good. Now on to my thoughts. Is this the best combat that Civ has ever seen? Or is that just hyperbolic? Oh well, I genuinely think it probably is. My view is that with the tools and the systems that we've chatted about in this video, Civ 7 is very well placed to have the best combat system of any comparable Civ game. Commanders definitely add more strategic depth with their promotions, their interactions with the map, and from my granted limited playing experience with an early and very much subject to change version of Civilization 7, I found they were a great addition, at least very enjoyable to use. The map changes add more options for both barriers and boosts, and I'm particularly interested in how useful and strong the civs whose units take advantage of the map, of new movement mechanics and interactions with the strategic map will actually play out. And obviously we have so much more to learn. I believe there are three commander types in the game, yet we've only broadly seen one of them, right? The land-based commander in the first age. It wouldn't surprise me if we therefore saw, probably in the Age of Exploration, a commander tied to the seas. And you don't have to be a genius to figure out that there's one more domain for combat in Civ. That would be the skies. The air, right? When we learn to fly. And that will probably be the modern age. Again, not confirmed, just a theory of mine from what I've seen and what I've played. I feel it would make a lot of sense to expand this, the commander system, out to all three domains of combat during the three ages in a Civ 7 game. And I'll leave you with that, to ponder that thought. Thank you very much for joining me today in this look at combat and more in Civilization 7. I'll see you next time.